plan is to take several minutes each evening to answer questions. So if you'll take that card that was on the seat, you can use a pen if you want, but there's a golf pencil there. And I would like to have you, as we're going through these ideas, if a question comes to your mind or something wasn't clear, put it on the card. And as you leave, they'll, they'll take the card. And tomorrow morning, I will receive in my email a list of all those questions. And I uh, will do my best to try to relate to them. So we'll take a minute to do that before I even start the questions. When you leave this evening, there will be two little booklets by Joe Cruz. Joe is one of the greatest evangelists I think this world has ever known. I could tell you stories about Joe all evening. And he made a whole library of little booklets on these topics. They're called Library of Sermons. And you'll receive both of these as you leave this evening. And each night, there will be another booklet by Joe on the topic that we deal with. This one is called Satan in Chains. That sounds pretty good to me. Does that sound like that to you? And tonight's topic is partly on the secret rapture, only the title of the book is Anything But Secret. So you'll get those as you leave. Now, I can't recall if I shared everything with you last night that I wanted to about your bringing a Bible. I would like you to, if, you, if you'd be willing, to bring a King James Bible. Now you say, oh, that's old fashioned and it has these and thous and thines. Listen, people love Shakespeare and he's way more archaic than the King James is. The King James is one of the very best translations that's ever been done. And beside that, um, I started memorizing stuff in the King James Bible when I was five years old. <laughs> So it's, um, I really like it. And besides that, most of you, those lights are too bright. Can you cut them down some? I can't see the folks too well with them that bright. Or are they just one setting? I'm not uh, hearing from anybody. We didn't have those last night. It's hard for me to see the saints when they're that bright. OK, thank you. That's better. Um, made me feel like I was preaching to nobody. <laughs> Besides that, um, I would like you to bring a King James Bible that will stay open in your lap and bring a pen that sh I think most of you would be OK with marking in your Bible. If somebody feels like that's sacrilegious, I'm OK with that. You should see my Bible. There's marks all the way through this thing. And um, you know how it is. You get so familiar with your Bible, I don't even have to remember where it is. I know right where it is on the page. <laughs> but in any case, I would love to have you uh, mark your Bibles. And there's one more thing about this. If you're using a different translation, you think about this. Every time a word in your translation is different than the one I read, it causes you to stop in your mind for just a second. Y'all with me on that idea? And it will, it will detract from your ability to focus on the text. That makes sense? So please find a King James or go spend $50 and get a nice one like this that stays open. All right. And have that pen poised. It's interesting that three people asked the same question with different wording, of course. Here's this uh, uh, story in the book of Daniel, I'm just reminding those of you that are new as well. There's only one apocalyptic book in the Old Testament, and it's the book of Daniel. There's one, only one apocalyptic book in the New Testament, and it's the book of Revelation. And actually, in this principle of letting the Bible be its own interpreter, you get a lot of help back and forth between those two books that, are, that talk about the end of this world in such uh, prophetic detail. Well, in the story in Daniel where he, the king gets a dream that uh, he can't remember of this metallic man or this image made of different metals, it relates to what we would call uh, Europe today. 
and maybe the surrounding areas because in the day when this dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar, he was essentially the ruler of the entire known world, if you will. So the questions that were raised here, all three of them about the same, what about the rest of the world? Doesn't the Bible care about those? Well, it's a very fair question, and the Bible doesn't answer the question exactly, but um, let me give you, I think if you surveyed the whole Bible, you would come to this conclusion. God had in mind that he would raise up a people who would, if you will, evangelize the world. Those were to be the children of Abraham, the Jews, if you will, the Israelites. Now, they messed it up pretty bad, and in fact, they finally killed their Messiah. Unbelievable. So what God has done, and the, and the Bible speaks of this, in fact, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, And it's the very last verse in the chapter. This is what it says. Very, now, there's things like this all through the New Testament. But this is probably the most uh, obvious reference to what God has in mind. Are you all there? Verse 29. Now, somebody may not know where Galatians is. Probably the person sitting next to you will, so you ask them for help. Galatians chapter 3. Last verse in the chapter is verse 29, and this is what it says. Well, let me start with 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Don't misunderstand. He's not trying to say there's only one gender. That's not his point. He's saying that in God's view, every person, he wants you and me to be his child. You all with me on that? That's what's going on here. Now notice the next verse. And if ye be Christ, then are ye whose seed? So the idea is, and heirs according to the promise, the idea is that since the Israelites themselves failed, God wants to take anybody who is willing to become, if you were, an Israelite and be an evangelist for the whole world. So I think that's the answer to your question. Certainly, God is interested in every person on the planet. It's, uh, he says in another place, God is not willing, th I think this is First Peter, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So uh, I hope that uh, helps you understand that he's interested in every race. Now, uh, this is a good one, part of our topic tonight. Do people die and go straight to hell? The answer is no. And you'll see clearly more of that from all the scriptures we're going to read. I, I, I suggested to you last night, or I, I made the claim, that hellfire is not burning at present. And when it does happen, it will. The, the, the Bible predicts this clearly. Revelation talks about it in, in detail. Um, it will be very, very brief. It will be a horrible thing, but uh, God has given everybody a chance, and if they don't want to, if they don't want to avail themselves of that, He will um, take their life, and there will be no record of them after that. Pretty strong stuff. Somebody asked, "What did the, what does the uh, feet represent?" And I'm sorry, the picture doesn't quite show the feet, but you may remember, as we read about that last night, uh, this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of this metallic image uh, made of gold, silver, brass, iron, and then the feet were mixed iron and clay. If you'll turn with me to Daniel chapter 2, we'll read the answer to this question. Right about a little bit to the right of the middle, you'll run into a big book, Ezekiel, and right after that is Daniel. Chapter 2. And if you will turn and look in verse, i got to get my glasses on for this one. Verse 
Yes, verse 43 refers, well, verse 41 refers to the toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron. Uh, and in verse 42, it talks about uh, the kingdom will be partly strong and partly broken. And then it says in verse 43, And whereas thou, whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another. And uh, we take this as a clear prophecy that the nation, nations of Europe will never be united under a single uh, country, a, a single empire again. They shall not cleave one to another. There are many people that have tried to do that. Napoleon, Charlemagne, Hitler, and others have not succeeded. You say, what about the European Union? Well, what about Brexit? But even, even without that, uh, they're not one nation. They try to have this unified financial structure they call the European Union. But the Bible declares that they will never be... Uh, one nation again. That's the meaning there uh, in that uh, prophecy of the feet that are, and, and since iron and clay, you can't mix them up. See, that's the idea. They shall not cleave one to another. All right. Um, the question is, will I recognize my children when I get to heaven? There's some other comments here. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 13. Now that'll be About this far into the book, right there we go. Whoops, I went past it. If you can see that, it's about that far, about a little over two thirds. If you're having a hard trouble finding it, First Corinthians thirteen and verse. I wrote it down here. Oh yes, thirteen. That's strange. I wrote the wrong thing down. Um, it says here that I will be known even as I am known. So, it, okay, all right, there we go. There it is. Even so, uh, verse 12, I'm in 14. That's why I couldn't find it. I was in the wrong chapter. <laughs> uh, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then... Then shall I be known even as, then shall I know even as also I am known. We take that to be teaching that we certainly will recognize one another when we're in the kingdom together. Now there's a there's a kind of a tough story. When I was in high school, I was in a boarding high school where there were dorms and everybody lived on the campus, and they would bring in a speaker every year for a week of prayer. In those days, the boys had to sit on one side and the girls had to sit on the other side. I know that sounds ancient, but that actually used to happen. And, uh, <laughs> and the students could raise questions. And one of them asked, uh, are we going to be able to be married in heaven? And this guy didn't have much tact. He just said, no. And there was this big moan on one side of the, <laughs> of the room. <laughs> but uh, it's true. Uh, Jesus said, we'll be like the angels, neither marry nor given in marriage. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but Neva and I have this arrangement that we're going to live together anyway. <laughs> we're not just going to be neighbors. Uh, don't you understand, folks, that whatever we think is wonderful here, God will have something in heaven almost infinitely better. So you will not be disappointed. And uh, we're going to be friends there just like we are here. And we'll, we'll let the Lord take care, take care of the details. <clears throat> I think we got them all. Uh, there's a couple here that I'll be answering in our uh, session this evening. Uh, before uh, I do that, I want to just show you a couple of topics that are coming up. Uh, this is our topic this evening, Revelation's Glorious Rapture. Uh, tomorrow night, we'll do the first part of the Mark of the Beast. On Tuesday, 
dead and buried but still alive. And on Wednesday, are the dead in hell, heaven, purgatory, or what? So let's begin with, uh, let me remind you. That's right, I had one more thing I wanted to tell you and a text I wanted to give you. Um, this idea, folks, of how you can find truth. Um, read everything that the Bible has to say. Uh, and pardon me? Did some, no, I'm sorry. And, and the third thing was, uh, I have to have a humble, teachable heart. Uh, I need to be, in fact, I need, to, I need to decide to do his will even before I know it. By the way, our marriage is a little bit like that. I'm not joking, folks. Is a happy marriage one where you or your spouse are so considerate and loving of each other that it doesn't matter what they ask, you, you're planning to do it before they ask. Does that make sense? Now, there's sometimes I groan about what she asks, but that's because I'm being more human than God wants me to be. He wants me to be the kind of a person that is willing to uh, do what he asks. And it's on that basis. And this is the text. If any man will do his will, he will know of the doctrine. And I said last night, uh, we, can't, uh, we can't be trivial with God and say, let me know what you want and I'll decide if I want to do it. I need to come to him with a heart that's, that's, that's dedicated Whatever it is he wants me to do, whatever he wants to teach me, uh, I've decided ahead of time. I want his will. And when I do that, folks, he promises to lead me into the truth. Are you all with me on this? And some of you may have some doctrines or beliefs tonight about this very challenging topic as to what happens uh, when someone dies. Where do they go? How, what, all of that kind of thing. And here's the text in John 7. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it's from God, John is saying this, or whether I'm just saying it myself. A very beautiful principle, folks, in this whole question. Now, there's the creature that we looked at in Revelation 13. Uh, he's behind the piano right now, but you can see him on the screen with the seven heads and the ten horns. And this is the beast which has the mark that you do not want to get. And we will be studying that, of course, as this week progresses. I want to take a couple more moments, even though time is rushing by, to have you turn with me to Revelation 1, where I only got a few verses into the chapter. Um, and that's pretty easy to find, because it's the last book in the Bible. I want you to notice especially um, verse 10 and on. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Do you remember that's the expression that John uses to say that he was having a vision, correct? And... Uh, I would be delighted if when I ask you a question like that, you say yes. You don't have to, but it, uh, it really helps an old teacher to feel like people are listening and getting it. <laughs> All right. Um, and he heard behind him a great voice that sounded like a trumpet. Almost anywhere in the Bible, and this happens many times, when there is a voice that's like a trumpet, it's God's. And this is what the voice said. I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, which, folks, became the book of Revelation. Are you all with me on this? Write in a book and send it to the seven churches in Asia. And then he lists the names. And John says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the middle of the candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps, that's girt about the breast or the chest with a golden girdle. It probably looked like a, uh, like a vest or something. 
His head and hair were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like flaming fire. His feet were so bright like burning brass you couldn't look at them. I'm paraphrasing. And what did his voice sound like? Or it was as loud as a waterfall, as Niagara Waterfalls. And, uh, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth there went a sharp two-edged sword. And his, and his countenance, or his face, was as bright as the sun ever gets. Isn't that amazing? And when I saw him, what happened? It just made him, if you will, collapse. But then it says, he laid his right hand upon me and said unto me, I love these words, folks, fear not. And then John uh, begins to write uh, this remarkable book that we call Revelation and from which, we, from which we'll be looking at throughout the week. That sort of catches us up as far as I wanted to to get last evening as far as reading that chapter is concerned. Now, in Revelation 14, and verse 9 and 10 is one of the most serious and frightening declarations you'll find in the whole Bible. There's an angel flying through heaven, according to that verse, that says, if anybody worships the beast and his image, that's the guy behind the piano, are you all with me? The beast that's going to have this mark and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and burning sulfur, brimstone, in the presence of the angels and even in the presence of Jesus. This is a very serious problem, folks. I don't want any of you to feel like you should ever have to suffer this, but it's a warning. Listen, folks, there are probably one or two people in here, and I won't, don't want you to raise your hands, of course, that have lost a child. I can't think of any grief that would be greater than losing a child. I suppose losing a spouse would be close to it, but when you lose a child, God feels that way about every single person that ever will live or has lived on this planet. It is a heartbreak for him, folks, to have to end their existence on this planet. An indescribable heartbreak. And so he gives this warning. He says, don't do this kind of thing. And it may sound harsh, but this is what the Bible teaches. That, uh, so this mark of the beast, folks, is a very serious issue. Now, this story, I don't know how true it is, but supposedly there was a gravestone that had this on it. Stop, my friend, as you go by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon shall be. Prepare yourself to follow me. And as the story goes, somebody came along and scribbled below that on the tombstone. To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. And I think, folks, everybody in this room is planning to go to the heavenly kingdom. Amen? And God wants you there. I'm repeating myself. He wants you there so bad, folks. He wants you, more, he wants you there more than you and I want our children to be there because he has a bigger heart than you and I do. Now, there was a survey done by Time magazine to see what people thought about heaven and hell and so forth. Do you believe in the existence of heaven where people live forever? Uh, and 81% uh, said they did. This is America. And 13% uh, said they didn't. Um, do you believe in hell, where people are punished forever? I don't believe that, but listen, uh, quite a few people believe that in this country. By the way, when I started in this work, well, let's say 20 years ago, 66% uh, of Americans professed to be uh, believers in God, and members of a Christian church. That number has dropped significantly down to around 60% now. But still, uh, this is a very religious uh, country, and uh, yet they have been taught that people are punished forever when they die. Most Christian churches teach that. 
Uh, some do not believe that. Do people get into heaven based mostly on their good things they do or on their faith in God or both? Good things? Six, faith in God? Isn't that interesting? And uh, quite a few thinks it takes both. That's a very interesting question we will deal with this week. Immediately after death, which of the following do you think will happen? Go to heaven immediately? And most Christian churches, folks, believe that that's what happens. And I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I'm just going to share with you. I'm going to show you from the Bible that is not what the Bible teaches. And that may be hard for some of you. I pray that you'll say in your heart, well, okay, I want to see what the Bible has to say. Um, but that's very commonly taught in Christian churches today. Not very many people think they're going to hell. <laughs> Somebody's mistaken, would you agree? Purgatory, taught by the Catholic Church. Quite a few, of course, uh, assumed that they're going to... I didn't know this till recently. I can't believe I didn't know the truth about this, but I was told by a good Catholic that, no, no, there's punishment going on in purgatory too and uh, not just in hellfire. Uh, a few people believe they'll be reincarnated to another creature of some kind, and some people think that it's just the end of everything. <clears throat> now, here is a scripture from Jesus' own words. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many go there. But... Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leads unto eternal life, if you will, and few there be that find it. Is that what God wants? Please say no. But Jesus is teaching a tragic truth. It will take determination on your part and mine to remain faithful to Jesus. The enemy, folks, the devil, is an expert at getting you and me sidetracked. Or, make, or getting us to make choices that seem so insignificant it doesn't maybe matter. And so Jesus said, listen, this is a straight pathway. It's perfectly doable, folks, for you to know Christ and be there. But is this a reasonable warning for you and me to hear? It's a serious matter. And I want you to take it serious. And by God's grace, that's certainly my choice and desire every day. Now, the place where we're going to end up is the holy city, sometimes called the New Jerusalem. And John tells the story in chapter 21, uh, how he sees this uh, coming from heaven. I'm, some of you know this, I'm sure. The, the Re book of Revelation teaches that once this world is purified with hellfire, that uh, God is going to bring heaven to this humble little planet. Isn't that amazing? And heaven is in the Bible called New Jerusalem. It's like a big city, about the size of Montana, and just as tall as Montana. A lot of floors. In fact, in the Bible, in, in, the, King, in the King James, when it says, in my father's house are many mansions, actually a better translation would be many rooms. But the Bible also teaches in the Old Testament that not only will we have that pretty nice room, I'll bet, uh, mansion-like room, uh, we're going to be able to build our, our, a place in the country if we like. We can build, it says we're going to build our own houses. I've always wanted to live by a lake. Anybody else like that want to live by a lake? And uh, there was a time when we were retiring and uh, we talked to our daughter and we said, why don't we both sell our places and let's buy a house on a lake? Uh, never happened, but uh, it's going to happen one day, Amen. And uh, the Bible characterizes a marriage in several ways. The Bible characterizes your relationship and mine with Jesus as a marriage. But it also characterizes this city as a bride adorned for her husband. By the way, how many of you have ever seen that photograph of the earth from the planet Saturn? 
and it's called the little blue dot. You seen that? Anybody? You should look it up. Uh, just Google it. Uh, the little blue, the little blue dot that is the Earth. And it was by accident that uh, the Voyager took a picture of the rings, and you see all of this. And in one of those rings, there's this, there's this single pixel. Do you know what I mean by pixel? When you have a TV screen, if you got close enough with a magnifying glass, there's little dots of color. And the Earth in that picture is a single pixel. That humble, tiny place is going to be the uh, seat of the government of the universe. The Bible actually teaches, friends, that there are other worlds. Did you know that? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, and apparently, Satan tried to do to all those other worlds what he did here, and apparently he had no success. So it's going to be a marvelous time. When Neva and I first were dating each other, in fact, our first real date was, can you believe this? You, you, you won't believe this. My mother sent me some avocados in the mail. I was, we were in college. I called Neva up and I said, would you like to go to the park and have some avocado sandwiches? Isn't, isn't that romantic? <laughs> what do you think she said? She said yes. She's been saying yes ever since. <laughs> we, we like to go on picnics. And when I get to heaven, when we're in heaven, I hope that she's willing to plan a picnic every day on a new planet. Will that be fun? And you can travel as fast or as slow as you want. You can travel at the speed of thought. If you doubt that, read chapter 9 in the book of Daniel. Daniel starts praying, and at the end of the prayer, an angel says, as soon as you started praying, God sent me down here. Now, he could have got there a lot faster than the pray took, than the prayer took, that story's in the Bible. All right. <clears throat> so this wonderful place where God wipes away all tears, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. All of this, verse 20, chapter 21, verse 4, will be passed away. There it tells about the size of the city and how it's uh, a cube, if you will. The length and the width and the what are all the same. Can you imagine a city 400 miles by 400 miles by 400 miles? All right. Um, and this is Jesus speaking in, in John's gospel. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I, listen to, listen to this, folks. I will come again. This one verse and I say this kindly, please. You know, I have this pastor friend. I love this man. He's about 15 years older than I, and he just died a couple years ago. We've been in his house many times. He and I are pastors of different denominations. Doesn't matter. I love this man. And uh, one day I said to him, do you believe in the secret rapture? He said, absolutely. I'm telling you, folks, that the secret rapture is not biblical, and I'll show you why. But my point here is that uh, Jesus says, I will come myself, and every place you find that story in the Bible, and I'll show you several of them, there, it is not secret. There is noise, there is trumpet voices, there's shouting. It is not secret, and that's why Joe Cruz wrote this book. Anything but secret. And there are many verses, folks, in the Bible that make that clear. Uh, if I have enough time, and I probably won't, I'd like to give you the history of how this idea of some kind of a secret rapture came to be. It was somebody's idea, and somebody published a Bible and stuck it in there, not like it was actual verses, but with the helps, and it became this doctrine. And it's diabolical, and I'll show you why that is. Jesus says, I will come myself. I'll receive you to myself that you can be where I am. That's John chapter 14. So what are the prophecies like concerning what we call the second coming? I think you'd be with me if I just reminded you that when he came as a baby, we refer to that as his first advent, his first coming to this planet. And the second coming is spoken of throughout the scriptures. 
Now, there are interesting aspects in the scriptures that tell us when the time is coming near, and I'm going to show you those right now. Uh, this is uh, Daniel writing. Uh, he was seeing some of these things in vision, and he, was, he realized he was looking at the time of the end of the earth. And in the book of Daniel, it says that many will run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. I'm sorry that I went too quick there. Uh, people used to think, and I was one of them, that this had to do with scientific knowledge and all the amazing things, the computers and the spaceships and all of this. Scholars now understand that this is referring to an increase in knowledge in the Bible. And running to and fro isn't people flying around in airplanes. It's looking back and forth in the scriptures, folks. That's what this is referring to. Near the end of time, and I'm just so thankful that you're among these people who are going to be running to and fro in the Bible. Are you all with me on that? What a wonderful thing that uh, is given to you and to me. Now, James, this, I'm jumping clear over into the New Testament. Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Is he speaking metaphorically? Say yes. Your gold and silver are rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you. This is a hard one, folks. It's hard for me. Neva and I have always been poor. <laughs> I'd like to be rich, but you know what? Being rich is very dangerous. Y'all with me on that? It's easy when you get some money to lose your focus on Jesus and start wanting stuff. Anybody, don't raise your hands. Anybody here out buying stuff? It detracts us, folks, from a walk with Jesus Christ. And so here's this warning. Now this is on day 40, after he was crucified and resurrected. Jesus is with the disciples outside of Jerusalem, and he's teaching them. I mentioned this last evening. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came and asked him privately. And they said, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Some of you may the, know the answer to this. I want you to focus on this very carefully, friends. This is an amazing statement. Jesus' answer is long, but the first thing he says is, take heed that what, friends? And I say this kindly, friends. The devil is in the business of deceiving people. He doesn't want a single person to be saved. And he can use well-meaning people, friends. He can use well-meaning people to teach things that will deceive you. The only safety, and here I am as a person, I, I'm teaching you. I don't want you to trust a person. I want you to become a deeper student of this book than you ever have in your life. Amen? Become a student. And God will guide you, folks. And if you set it in your hearts to do what he wants you to do, he will see to it that you understand the truth. Isn't that a beautiful proposition? I love that. And there's deception, folks, is going to be a big issue. For many shall come in my name saying, I'm Christ and will deceive many. I was tempted to get ahead of this text, but I'll wait. Then he starts giving, this is Matthew chapter 24, a long list of signs of, uh, that his coming is near. Uh, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Have you, has there ever been a time on planet Earth when there is so much strife among nations? It is horrible. And this is one of the signs that Jesus' coming is near. And famines. Oh, you know about these terrible things. This photo was taken some time back. Just break your heart. A billion people go to bed tonight without enough food. Pestilences. 
We all know about pestilences. We're in the midst of one right now. And I got to be very careful, folks, because uh, uh, this could be misunderstood. I think this is of the devil's making, and I think that it shows that we are near the end of time. We'll see later this week, folks, how our freedoms will be taken away from us, irrespective of the Constitution. And you and I today now know that can be done without the vote of any government assembly, just some person with a little bit of authority. Now, fortunately, at the moment, I don't know if you know this, the sheriff of Los Angeles County, these aren't his exact words, he said, you will not find us enforcing this. That's pretty good. I, I take my hat off to that man. I'm sorry, take my mask. I'm making my hat off. <laughs> <laughs> but it's coming. I'll tell you, folks, I've been in this kind of work for many, many years, as I told you last night. We have never had signs around us that show us how close we are to the end of time. And the mark of the beast, friends, as we will show you later this week, will be a dictate that you have to worship in a certain way. You all with me on this? And if you don't do it, you know what it says in Revelation chapter 13? If you don't, if you don't worship the image of the beast, we'll talk about this. This beast, uh, there will be an image to that beast and it says right in there, if you don't worship him, that you will be killed. Wow. And uh, it will be a frightful time, but in a way it will be a wonderful time. That's an old one, but it was a big one, wasn't it, when uh, Mad Cow was an issue. And, of course, the weather, pestilences, problems, earthquakes in many, divers means many places. Oh, look at this. Uh, these are the 6th to the 20th century and showing you uh, earthquakes that were greater than magnitude 7, such as that one and, of course, the famous one in uh, San Francisco was uh, 7.8. So these are earthquakes uh, that have been greater than 7 and uh, they only were a couple per century until fairly recently. And look what has happened to the number of earthquakes on this planet that are seven or greater. Just astonishing. Fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And uh, Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, those days he just talked about, the pestilences and the, and the, and the wars, immediately after that, the sun would be darkened and the moon would not give her light. The stars from heaven would fall. Turns out this kind of thing has happened quite some time ago. I actually think, folks, that Jesus intended to come a lot sooner than he has had to delay his arrival. Because this idea of a dark day, you can look these things up if you want. This is, this is a verse from Revelation. Speaking of that, the sun, chapter 6, the sun became black as sackcloth of air, and the moon became as blood. But you can look this up in various historical sources where there was uh, impenetrable darkness all day long uh, in the eastern half of this nation, uh, now over 100 years ago. And then uh, we have went through the Perseid, uh, the Perseid, uh, what's the word I'm after, uh, meteor shower, uh, which we do every year. But that particular time, it looked to people like every single star in heaven was coming to the ground. You read about it. It's an interesting thing. A fulfillment of Bible prophecy and already that long ago. And this is just from the, one of the papers in New York. No philosopher or scholar has ever recorded an event, I suppose, like that of yesterday morning uh, about how these stars fell. It seemed like the whole sky was falling down. So here's what Jesus said. He's still speaking to his disciples. Signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations. Perplexity. Oh, folks, you know this today. Uh, in the news today, uh, I, I'm trying to say his name. Um, he was the Secretary of State a couple, three presidents ago. No, further than that. But anyway, uh, 
China is, you all know this, is, is wanting to be the superpower in the world. Russia is not a big issue because they don't have the money. China has the money and the military might. And we are in distress of nations, wouldn't you say? And Jesus said that's going to be a sign, a harbinger of his coming. Perplexity. There's no solution. That's what perplexity is. And of course, look what's going on these days. It's just astonishing in the streets of our cities. Men's heart failing them for fear. That's not heart attacks, folks. That's such anguish and anxiety that there seems to be no answer. Uh, and looking after those things which are coming, the powers of heaven will be shaken. We're not sure just exactly the details of all this, but we can see these things taking place. And of course, can you believe it's, what, been 20 years already? Uh, uh, the kinds of things that we're looking at here in the last days. Perilous times. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It's awful, folks, in the news today. Words that were bad words when I was a child, people just use them. And they print them in the media or just put some of the letters down so you, of course, know what they're talking about. Blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy, no natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent isn't referring to our body. It's talking about that they can't control themselves. They're fierce despisers. Wow, what a story, folks, about what's happening just before Jesus comes. Now, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And you can read this story in the book of Luke. There will be faith. It may be a small number of people. Uh, our universities today, folks, I've got to be careful not to get sidetracked on this, but um, our universities that are tur turning out young people who are faithless and um, ready to tear society apart. This professor, I didn't put his name in here for the sake of being careful. Anybody, this is an Old Testament scholar. Anybody who believes that they know the slightest thing about the second coming of Jesus is stupid and sacrilegious. Another one, I don't believe there's any such thing. We don't teach it in nine years in this seminary. Can you believe in a seminary? A friend of mine went there and heard this. Uh, this seminary has never had a sermon on it. Students, the very idea that Jesus will come floating down on a cloud to bail us out is ridiculous. This is the kind of thing that's going on, folks, today in such contradiction to the Bible. Now, here's an interesting verse. Paul writes, he was traveling from city to city, and he, and he left the city of Thessalonica and ended up in the city of Berea, and he was so pleased with the Bereans. Why? He said, because they received the word with all readiness of mind. Would you decide to do that? Not from me, folks, but from the word. Be somebody who receives the word with readiness of mind. And they searched the scriptures every day to see if it was true. So they believed. Many of them did. Let's, let's start out for a few minutes with how will the second coming not happen? If somebody says, ah, Christ is here, what did Jesus say? This is still the same story, folks. He's talking to the disciples, and the first thing he said was, be, be careful that you're not deceived. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. You've heard about this. Every once in a while, somebody will be walking down the street and talking and thinking they're Christ. And uh, maybe that some of them can show great signs and wonders. And maybe with these things, they could actually deceive people who are very, I'm paraphrasing obviously, very, very sincere. So we've got to cling to what Jesus said and not be moved. So if they say, uh, go to the desert, there, that's where he is. What does Jesus say? Don't do it, don't believe it. Here's the idea, folks. I'll read, to the, I'll read the scriptures to you in a second. Uh, the Bible teaches that an angel can make himself or itself look like any person they want to. They have that power. This is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. And uh, it's also in another place that I'll read to you. And the idea is that it's, it's 
fairly obvious that Satan is going to personate Christ and will come to this earth and uh, claim to be Christ and claim that certain things should be done, done that are different from what the Bible says and he will be so marvelous and have such great power that multitudes will just follow. Y'all with me on the idea? And if uh, you're tempted to watch it on television, what do you think would be the wisest thing to do? Do you think you could get mesmerized by, by somebody as talented as an angel? Do you think that they would speak with such marvelous acuity and, and apparent wisdom that you could, you could uh, everything you've decided to believe in this book could be swept away by their great presence of ability? So Jesus said, don't believe it. Don't go out there. Don't even go out there via your television. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so all shall, listen folks, shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Does that sound like a secret? It says in Revelation, we quoted it last night, every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all nations of the earth shall wail because of him. Everybody is going to be able to see this. Uh, I say, the reason I hesitated with everybody, when Jesus comes, we read this last night, we'll see it again. The, the forgiven people, the Bible calls them the righteous, will be resurrected, but not the unforgiven. They will be resurrected later. We'll see this. That's what made me hesitate when I said everybody. It will be everybody who's alive, including all those who are forgiven and are resurrected. <clears throat> an angel of light. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. This is 2 Corinthians. Be not forgetful to enter. This is the, this is the verse I was referring to from Hebrews 13. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for some thereby have entertained who? Not knowing it, correct? Amazing. Amazing that God has given angels the capability to do that. Now, mind you, the earth is filled with evil angels as well. Are you aware of that? We'll study this later. The, the Revelation teaches that uh, Satan was an angel. He was the highest angel. And he, the Bible says he would, this is chapter 13, 12. He was cast out of heaven and his angels were cast out with him. And it says they were cast out to the earth. And they still have power quite similar to what they have when they were obedient to God. So it's, uh, it's quite an enemy, folks. Thankfully, our guardian angel will protect us from them as long as we are interested in having them do that. Let's take a minute now. How will the coming happen? Every eye shall see him. And, when the, and this is chapter one of Acts, I quoted this last night. This is the disciples. When Jesus had spoken all these things that we looked at, all of chapter 24, we just read a few verses. Uh, behold, uh, well, or they, be, they were watching, and he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they were looking steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men, I think these were angels, stood by them in white apparel, saying, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And then in Revelation again, chapter 1, we, we actually read this last evening. He cometh with clouds, and I'm going to pass it up because we read it uh, a couple of times, uh, last night and again this evening. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. and They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is Jesus speaking again to the disciples before uh, he was lifted up. And in the next chapter, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. So uh, this is Matthew now writing about this. Jesus has gone to heaven, but of course he's inspiring the disciples what to say. Now we're back to chapter 5 of Revelation. I heard the voice of many angels. Remember, John was told to write the things which thou hast seen. 
I didn't quote this part to you, and the things that shall be, uh, and the things that shall be hereafter. He was supposed to write all of this as he saw it in vision in chapter 5. He's, he's in vision, and he hears the voice of angels around God's throne, and the beasts, the living creatures. Uh, most of you have read this, but in the book of Revelation, there are some very interesting things, and one is that there are 24 elders that are sitting on small thrones around God's big throne. They're called elders. A term in the Bible that refers to uh, upright or righteous people. We don't know for sure who they are. Were they, were they resurrected when, when Jesus was resurrected? Did you know a whole bunch of people, their graves were broken up? It doesn't say they were resurrected until Jesus was, but their, brave, their graves were broken up when he died. Pretty interesting. Apparently, <laughs> these dead people are lying around for two days until Jesus is resurrected, and then they are too. We don't know who they are, but anyway, that's what the Bible teaches there in the book of Revelation these 24 elders, and then there's four living creatures, or in the, in the King James, they're called four beasts. The first one looked like a calf, the second one looked like a lion, the second one had wings, the third one did, and there are these four living creatures, and they do certain things in the book of Revelation. Sometimes they worship, sometimes they speak, and that's what it's referring to here when it says, and the beasts and the elders, that's the 24 of them, and the number of them was thousands of thousands, I'll just pass that up, because of the angels that were with those. And here, this is one of the greatest uh, passages in all of Scripture, just describing Christ's coming to, t to raise up the, the righteous people or the forgiven people. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with what? His voice will sound something like a trumpet. Uh, and the dead in Christ, notice those three words. If your Bible is open, I'm sorry I'm going way too fast, but if your Bible is open, please underline those three words. You probably get what that means, but let's me make sure. These are people who died, forgiven. So they are in Christ. Uh, an interesting term. Uh, to the somebody who's never thought of it before, you say, well, what does that mean? It means, folks, that they committed their lives to him, wanted him to, to control their life, if you wish, and uh, follow his every teaching, and when they died, they died in Christ. A lot of you are familiar with that. It didn't bother you to hear it, but some of you may never heard that before and say, what in the world does that mean? The dead in Christ shall rise first. Does this sound like a secret event, friends? This is one of the many clear descriptions of his coming. It's amazing. And the problem, folks, with the secret rapture theory is this. People have been taught that uh, before the tribulation, the righteous people will be snatched up. And the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that if you and I live, that we will go through the tribulation. And it's described uh, in Revelation. We'll see that some more later. Uh, it's the tribulation. I'm watching the clock. It's the tribulation of the seven last, seven last plagues. And by the time the seven last plagues are falling, this is a very interesting story, folks. No one will have a chance to change their minds. It's an important thing, folks, not to put this off. What if I died tonight? Would my probation, probation have closed? Yeah. I don't want to frighten you. I just want us to, to determine that we are going to live, even though I make a mistake. Immediately when that happens to you, it will come to you, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. And ask forgiveness. But uh, let me just remind you of something. There's a very interesting type of the end of the world in the flood. All of you must be familiar with this. Noah preached for 120 years while he was building this boat. 
when nobody had ever seen a drop of rain or a cloud. And they laughed him to scorn. Now, the Bible says that one day, when the ark was finished, all of a sudden, out of the woods came this trail of animals. You all know the story. And the clean animals, two by two, the unclean animals, a strange term, seven. Did I get it the other way around? Thank you. I was just testing you. <laughs> You'd think that the public would have said, whoa. Isn't it amazing, folks, under such evidence that they said that the, they stayed in their determination to not believe? Here's the interesting story. Noah makes his final appeal from the, probably from the door of the ark. His family's in there. The animals are all in there. Not a soul. Now think about this. The Bible says an angel closed the door. How long before the rain started? The Bible says seven days. Was that a time of testing? He says, no. The testing was this. The rain didn't come. And this is actually a type, friends, of the close of this earth's history. Because if you, think of, if you look at this carefully, you will see that probation closes for people when the seven plagues start to fall. And the people like you and me who are remaining faithful, it will be a very difficult time to keep trusting God just like it was for, Moses, for, for Noah and his family. Are you all with me on this parallel? This is the principal thing that helps us understand where this thing we call the close of probation occurs in the book of Revelation. And there's this terrible seven last plagues and finally then, Christ comes, and fire destroys the unforgiven people. This is Revelation 16. There were voices and light thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. The heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. I'm not sure just exactly what that will look like, but that's the description in the Bible. Some cataclysmic thing in the sky and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And even I have both memorized these passages, and we say them to each other sometimes when we're traveling. The, great, the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, bond men, free men, they hide in, in caves and uh, under the rocks. And look what they say to the mountains and the rocks. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who what? Who is that? Actually, that's the Father. And then it says, um, and from the face, I'm sorry, it's the other way around, and from the face of him that sits on the throne. And um, I'm sorry, I was correct. And from the wrath of the Lamb. So there's both God, the Father, and the Son involved here. Uh, and all of these wealthy, high uh, officials, and on and on, are just overwhelmed with this horrible situation when they realize what has finally happened to them. And they, they don't even want to see God or Jesus. They, 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 they want to be buried under a mountain. They want to die rather than see him. Isn't that amazing? Amazing story. Let's make sure, folks, we're not among them. For the great day of his wrath has come. Who can stand? Well, how soon is near? Jesus said, no man knows that day or hour. Actually, he said, I don't even know it, just my father. So be ready. Because when you think it isn't going to happen, it will. So this is Jesus' counsel to you and me, folks. He's not in the business of having us try to guess when he's going to come. I've got some pictures, and since it's four minutes after, I'm not going to show them to you. But there are people like uh, uh, this man on the radio 
in uh, Sacramento that kept setting dates when Jesus was coming. You remember that? I can't say his name without putting it on the screen. And then there was Hal Lindsey, who wrote the book, The Great Late, Plan the Great Late Planet Earth, about the book of Revelation. He made a number of predictions in there which all failed, and so the book fell out of, out of uh, interest, even though it had sold millions and millions of copies uh, with his grandiose idea of what uh, uh, the end would be like. And uh, this is more on the secret rapture. Uh, know this. Uh, well, let me just tell you this, folks. It's in the little booklet. Almost every time when it talks about a thief in the night, because people take that to mean that uh, Jesus' coming will be secret. Almost every passage where that's mentioned, there's a lot of noise. There's trumpets. There's all kinds of, of noise. It's not secret. What is, what is being referred to here is that it's unexpected. It's not that it's going to be a secret rapturing of people, and suddenly there's nobody flying the airplane that you're riding in. You've heard those stories. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this evening for your word. I thank you for these marvelous promises of your love, of your guidance, of your warnings, and the obvious evidence that you long to be with every one of us for eternity. Thank you for this and praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen.